Hello guys, welcome back to the Keen Medic channel. This is Vishal here and today we are going to be talking about Wendy's weakness, okay? So, in this video, we will go through the scenario first, okay? I'll give you the scenario and then we'll talk about what you think, what the differential diagnosis you have in mind based on what the scenario is. And then we'll have a closer look at what the history really is. Then we'll put everything together, we'll have a scenario review, and at the end we'll do a paces bundle, okay? So we'll go through the entire clinical condition and we'll go through all the relevant bits so that you are ready for paces, okay? So make sure you pause the video so that you get the most out of the video when I tell you to, okay? So you can think about it in the way that you should be. For those of you who are really motivated, I have put together this course just for you, okay? So in this course, I will be br bringing together a lot of uh, clinical conditions that you will be getting in paces, a lot of uh, frameworks and strategies that you can implement right away, and plenty of downloadable materials that you can download for yourself and keep forever. So the link is down below in the description use the code here youtube 15 that will get you 15 percent off okay go and check it out guys you won't regret it let's carry on so the scenario is wendy is a 49 year old lady who has been admitted due to worsening weakness all over the body past medical history she's got hypertension and hypothyroidism so the key thing here is so she's kind of middle-aged okay uh, and woman and weakness all over the body okay so this this doesn't sound like an acute vascular event because if you if it was an acute vascular event you wouldn't get weakness all over the body right on arrival in a and e her, she is alert okay a temperature is normal 36 8 heart rate of 78 blood pressure is normal 124 73 respiratory rate is fine saturations are normal as well so basically all the orbs are fine okay any team have examined the patient and found that she's moving all of her forelimbs, okay, so uh, that's good, and, but the power is reduced all over, okay, so there's a global reduction in power all over. And GCS is 15, so that's great. She reports double vision though, but she's got normal eye movements according to the a &E team, right. So someone who is basically weak all over and there's some kind of double vision at some point, but eye movements are normal, so we need to dig into this a bit more, we don't really know what's going on, okay. But based on this information, what do you think? What are your differentials and further management as the medical registrar? You, you are going to be clocking the patient. You are going to be seeing this patient. What is going through your mind? While you're having a think, make sure you smash the like button below, guys, because that really helps grow the channel. It also helps the video to be viewed by many of your colleagues and friends so they can get educated. They can get the help as well. Okay, so make sure you do that. Thank you. All right, so let's carry on. So in terms of the differentials, what I was thinking is it should look something along those lines. Obviously, you have to have a very wide set of differentials because you don't know exactly what's going on just yet, okay? This is a young patient with no real lateralizing signs at the moment. So you'd ha you have to think quite widely, okay? So she's got hypothyroidism. She probably is on medication, you know, like carbamazole, for instance. So if she has been overtreated she is probably she may well be hypothyroid okay so if she's hypothyroid she may well have generalized weakness lack of energy so overtreated hypothyroidism that's a possibility adrenal insufficiency is another possibility so she has got hypothyroidism so this is most likely due to an autoimmune cause so if she's got that then there is also a chance that she may have adrenal insufficiency okay she could have connective tissue disease along the same lines if she has got an autoimmune phenomenon going on already. She may have connective tissue disease. Connective tissue disease, I mean things like systemic lupus erythematosus, you know, uh, systemic sclerosis, stuff like that. Diabetic neuropathy is also possible. We don't know if she is diabetic uh, from the past medical history. According to her, she's not, but she may well be. A lot of times patients present quite late on as well. So that is possible. So if she's got diabetic neuropathy, she may well have, you know, weakness that um, uh, that is presenting in different parts of the body. Malignancy or intracranial space occupying lesion, it's one of the differentials. It is less likely because she's not having signs of kind of inter raised intracranial pressure. Uh, so she's not really vomiting, but that's something you should be thinking of. You should definitely be scanning this patient anyway, so you'll find out, right? 
Stroke is another one that you should be thinking about in any patient who comes in with a, a weakness, okay? But she doesn't have lateralizing signs, so this is less likely. Motor neuron disease is possible. So motor neuron disease it would present with motor type symptoms without re any real sensory involvement. So she doesn't really have sensory involvement, do does she? So that's something that you should be thinking about. Although she's a bit young, okay? So, but something that you should be thinking about anyway. All right. So here's the full story. You go and see the patient and you get the history out from her and the rest of the um, kind of ambulance crew notes and stuff like that. Okay, so you put everything together. So she's had generalized lethargy all, all over the body for the last four weeks. So about a month now, she's had generalized lethargy. So most likely definitely not a stroke. Okay. She, it's, she says that it is worse at the end of the day, okay, rather than at the start of the day. She has noted double vision over the last three weeks as well, which comes on in the evenings after working on her laptop for the uh, in the you know during the day, and this resolves the following morning. So she wakes up okay, and then during the course of the day she develops this double vision. Okay, so that's interesting. That's something uh, worth noting. She has had no head injuries. She also denies any joint pain, stiffness in the joints, rashes, hematuria, fevers. So these are also all features of connective tissue diseases which she does not have, according to the patient. Okay. All right. She is eating and drinking, but she is reporting some difficulty with swallowing. Okay, that's another one. So generalized lethargy, some issues with vision. She is having uh, this double vision at the end of the day weakness at the end of the day and also difficulty swallowing okay so now you should be thinking a few things okay um all right so you examine her and you find that she's tilting her head upwards so she's doing that okay so she's doing that why is she doing that because she's got bilateral ptosis so her eyelids are down okay so to compensate for that she's doing that okay to have it to to see you basically her eye movements appear normal Okay, so that's that's good, but the power in the in all the limbs are reduced. So she's able to lift off against gravity, but she's not really able to resist against power. So power is about three out of five. So that's concerning. So you should be thinking about a few things here. Reflexes are fine. Uh, so there is no sensory loss as such, but coordination is difficult to assess because of her weakness. So when somebody is really weak, okay, they, they can't really do anything in terms of coordinating. So it's really difficult to assess coordination because of the weakness. This does not necessarily mean they don't have coordination involvement. It's just difficult to assess clinically, okay? And her speech appears to be slurred as well. Right, so her CT head is fine. There are no acute abnormalities of note. So you uh, you then wait for the blood test, and the blood tests show that you know uh, all the kind of um, organ functions are normal, FBC renal function, liver function are normal, CRP is normal, HbA1c is 38, that is normal. Okay, so she does not appear to have diabetes. Thyroid function is also fine, so there is adequate control rather than over. Okay, so she's not become hypothyroid; she is pr pretty okay. And you, of course, you know, get a 9 a.m. cortisol done the following morning because you want to look for evidence of adrenal insufficiency. And that is also within normal ranges. So what's going on? We, sh we don't really know at this point. So MRI head is fine because, you see, you have got a patient with generalized weakness and the CT head is okay. So you have to uh, go ahead and perform an MRI head to investigate this further. There is no uh, intracranial lesion that would explain the uh, weakness. Okay, so you send off the autoimmune screen, which inevitably takes quite some time. Okay, autoimmune screen takes several days, if not a couple of weeks, to come back. You also send off an anti ACHR, anti acetylcholine receptor antibody. Okay, so you send that off as well. So I'm sure you know what this antibody is for. So what are your top diagnoses now, guys? So we have obviously looked at a lot of different things and uh, you should be able to narrow these down now. So I think these should be the 
top differentials now myasthenia or motor neuron disease okay so something really neurological is going on there's nothing sensory there's nothing lateralizing there's nothing really endocrine going on here so these would be the top differentials okay sometime later the antibody you sent off anti acetylcholine receptor antibody is positive okay now you have the diagnosis basically well done so basically the patient has got myasthenia okay so let's go back to wendy let's see how she has come in okay just so we can understand you know and it, it makes sense okay so let's see so she has a background of hyperthyroidism so this is most likely due to an autoimmune cause okay like l the large majority of hyperthyroidism is caused by uh, so she has had generalized weakness over weeks with fatigability. So fatigability is the phenomenon where when you do a repeated um, exercise, repeated activity, then you become weaker and weaker with subsequent uh, repetition. So that's what it is. And you have that all over the body, which is why uh, she was getting weakness and diplopia with, with the um, double vision towards the end of the day as the day progressed. Okay, that's what fatigability is. She has no lateralizing signs, so this is not a stroke. And she has had ocular involvement. So ocular involvement is one of the kind of hallmark features of myasthenia, okay? And that is that is something that's very important to keep in mind. It is, almost all patients will have ocular involvement at some point during the course of the disease. So she has had diplopia and also ptosis, okay? So remember, she had bilateral ptosis with uh, head tilting to compensate for the ptosis. She had slurring of speech. So slurring of speech uh, without a stroke is uh, is um, a feature in a couple of uh, conditions, such as uh, motor neuron disease, where they can get bulb or pseudobulbar palsy um, and also myasthenia. And the uh, acetylcholine receptor is positive. So that really clinches the diagnosis. That tells you what's going on. Okay. So we are finally here at the biceps bundle for paces. Let's go through it. So she has got myasthenia. So what is myasthenia? It's an autoimmune condition. The features are ocular involvement. That's the top one. Okay, and majority have this at some point during the course of the disease. They'll have generalized weakness uh, progressing over weeks to months and fatigability at the end of the day. So it progresses towards the end of the day. Okay. And they, a lot of them will have facial and speech involvement as well. So they may have some kind of, you know, facial involvement, weakness and speech involvement with slurring, even swallowing difficulties. There are some triggers that you should be aware of when it comes to myasthenia. So triggers would uh, triggers meaning things that might cause the myasthenic crisis to come on, an episode to come on. Okay, these would be things like intercurrent illness. So if they've got an infectious illness, that will bring it on. Things like hypokalemia can bring it on, pregnancy in ladies can bring it on, and a lot of medications that you know you need to be aware of. So antibiotics, uh, beta blockers are some examples, but there's an entire list of that. You don't have to remember every single one of them. You can just remember a few so that you can discuss this in your exam, okay? So you don't have to be an encyclopedia of medicine to pass paces. It's just about being sensible. As long as you know that you would need to check medications in patients with myasthenia, then you would be fine, okay? Investigation. So you would do all the normal things that you would do for every other patient. You would do all the basics first, you know, FBCs and bone profile, liver function, all of that. You would look for the endocrine causes as well, like HbA1c for diabetes, thyroid function, and cortisol, as we did in this case. Then you would definitely need to progress on to some serious imaging to look for any intracranial or spinal causes of the weakness. So CT and MRI head with spine are very much required, okay? Uh, and you would also be co uh, asking your neurology colleagues to look at the patient and they will inevitably ask for these uh, imaging modalities, all right? And of course, you would need to send off the diagnostic test, with, which is anti-acetylcholine receptor antibody, anti-ACHR. But this can be negative in some patient, patients, in which case um, you would need to send off something called anti-musk antibody if the anti-ACHR is negative, okay? Nerve conduction studies or EMG will reveal that, you know, that with repeated stimulation, there is a reduction in the potential. And... The other thing that you should be thinking about is to look for a thymoma in patients with myasthenia gravis. So you would need to do a CT chest to look 
for a dimoma, okay? Because that's a very clear, there's a very clear association with these over the years, this, this has been recognized. How do you manage this condition? So largely the mainstay is peridostigmine, which is an acetylcholine receptor inhibitor, okay? So that's what you would give to patients, okay? Uh, but of course, you wouldn't start that necessarily. This is for your discussion purposes. You would always need to involve your neurology colleagues before you start these patients on peridostigmine, okay? And if, if a patient uh, has got myasthenia and is on peridostigmine, you should also be contacting your neurology colleagues before stopping them or titrating the doses, okay? Don't take risk with these sort of things. Steroids, of course, like most other uh, autoimmune causes, would also be involved, especially in acute settings. Azathioprine can also be used in some patients, uh, but before you uh, put these patients on azathioprine, you would need to check something called thiopurine methyl transferase enzyme activity because you can have um, severe bone marrow suppression with azathioprine in patients who have reduced TPMT levels. Thymectomy. So, if they have got a thymoma, you would need to refer them on to uh, the surgeons for a thymectomy. However, in some patients, uh, even without an enlarged thymus gland, they may still need thymectomy or will be considered for a thymectomy because some have been shown to have benefit. Okay. Complications that can happen in myasthenia are, well, it's mainly largely respiratory. So aspiration pneumonia can happen because of their impaired swallow, speech, things like that, okay? And also, of course, progressing on that uh, they can also have uh, respiratory failure. So they may need ventilatory support, which is why you would need to uh, have early ITU intervention if they come in with, an, uh, with a crisis episode and they are obviously, you know, in respiratory failure. All right, so take a screenshot of this, you know, uh, bring this together, use this for your revision. I hope this makes sense, guys. I hope this is useful. Make sure you go and check out the book, which is linked below in the description, as, as well as the course, which I've brought together just for you and use the code when you're going to the course, okay? I will see you in the next video. Take care.